This video was sponsored by Campfire, guaranteed not to fuse itself to your hand and or whisper dark forbidding secrets in your ear. A while back, I did a trope talk on MacGuffins, and part of my thesis in that video was that the term MacGuffin gets bandied about a little more than it should and applied to stuff it doesn't actually describe. Sometimes it almost gets treated as a synonym for plot device, a category of objects that exist to drive the plot in specific directions, but technically MacGuffins are just a subcategory of plot device. Specifically, MacGuffins are plot devices that only drive the plot by being wanted, with no other factors playing into their role in the story. But MacGuffins have something of an evil twin, a plot device that resembles them superficially but drives the plot through some internal malevolence that corrupts the story around them. Instead of being a thoroughly passive player in the narrative, these plot devices are active and antagonistic. I am, of course, referring to the trope of the cursed artifact. Cursed artifacts are a very common and extremely old plot device. They show up sporadically in Greek mythology and much more frequently in Norse mythology, where you can't go 10 feet without tripping over a cursed ring or a sword or a necklace or something. So suffice to say that this trope has some staying power. The base concept is very simple. A cursed artifact is an object that has some kind of negative effect on the people around it. The exact effect and the radius can vary. Some cursed artifacts only affect the person who owns them, while others radiate a highly rancid vibe that makes everything around them progressively worse. Cursed artifacts often function by tempting or encouraging the wielder's darker impulses, but sometimes they're a little more brute force and just make bad stuff happen around them, like they radiate bad luck. Cursed artifacts are frequently acquired by protagonists, at which point they become a problem. The plot is often driven, at least in part, by the protagonist's need or desire to get rid of the cursed artifact, often in opposition to a usually curse-driven need or desire to keep it. Now, the nature of the quote-unquote curse can vary a lot. Some cursed artifacts are explicitly magically cursed by some kind of supernatural effect, but some are more like radioactive or infectious or otherwise dangerous in a much more mundane and physical way. And the nature of the artifact and the curse determines a lot about the role it can play in the story. For instance, some cursed artifacts are sentient, either haunted by some malevolent entity or being a malevolent entity in their own right. It's most common for sentient artifacts to be actively malicious, although it's technically not necessary. Necessary. In rare cases, the artifact's personality might be totally chill, but the effect it has on the people around it is still generally negative, which is often what happens when the cursed artifact is technically a person. Consider how writers often frame Helen of Troy, a woman whose beauty was so ridiculously over the top that her abduction triggered a ten-year war that she was constantly blamed for despite having no active part in the proceedings. Her beauty is literally treated like a curse. Anyway, that aside, sentient, malevolent artifacts are pretty dangerous. They frequently whisper dark, corruptive truths into the ear of the wielder to try and push them into more evil. They also often act on their own. Cursed swords are especially bad about this and will frequently jerk around and try to stab people on their own with minimal input from the wielder. In extreme cases, sentient artifacts might try to take over the user and function as a superpowered evil side. These things are extremely common in settings like D&D and are also fairly common in the broader space of fantasy literature where they are almost always specifically swords. Depending on the moral standing of the wielder, dealing with these things can be pretty tricky. More morally upstanding wielders generally don't like using them at all, but they might be magically bound to the artifact and unable to get rid of it. In other cases, the wielder might not approve of the artifact's attitude, but needs their power for whatever reason. In more morally dubious cases, the wielder and the artifact might get along fine, most common with villains for obvious reasons. An excellent example of this kind of cursed artifact is the demon sword Stormbringer from the Elric Saga, a series of classic fantasy novels written by the excellently named Michael Moorcock. Stormbringer is a fun case because it is an extremely evil weapon. It's literally an actual demon that drains people's souls out through a single cut and uses them to fortify its wielder. The wielder in question is the protagonist Elric, a chronically ill and ultimately good-hearted guy who unfortunately has to use Stormbringer as basically a mobility aid since the evil power-up is significantly more accessible than the medicine he'd have to take otherwise. The idea of swords that are actually demons is actually pretty popular in non-Tolkien classic fantasy. The concept also shows up in Larry Niven's short story Not Long Before the End, where the demon sword actively vampirizes the life force of the wielder who can't put it down because the demon is biting their hand. Now, some cursed artifacts aren't technically sentient on their own, but are still corruptive in a passive way, encouraging bad impulse pulses and negativity in the wielder. They don't abruptly flip a morality switch or anything, but they usually push the character emotionally. It's fairly common for wielders to feel more tired and angry to encourage them to lash out at the people around them, for instance. Now, it might be more accurate to say these cursed artifacts aren't obviously sentient. They frequently display some kind of agenda, often in service of a large-scale villain they belong to, but they tend to be fairly passive in the story itself and don't display the kind of agency we expect from a sentient cursed artifact. These artifacts won't unexpectedly swing around and decapitate anyone, but they will slowly 
slowly and insidiously encourage the darker impulses of the wielder and turn them into a worse version of themselves. They won't take over the character, but they'll try and wear them down. This is arguably the category the One Ring falls into. Sure, it serves a dark master with a powerful will of his own, but the ring itself can't do much beyond bounce in inconvenient directions. The insidious nature of the One Ring is that even if it doesn't manage to corrupt the wielder within the first minute of contact like it did with the Smeagol, it wears down the willpower of everyone around it and it's just frankly exhausting to deal with. The effect it has on people can be overt or subtle depending on the individual, and the subtle effects are often significantly more dangerous. And lastly, some cursed artifacts aren't sentient or insidiously corruptive, they're just really bad to be around. They don't tend to have an explicit impact on anyone's moral character, but they do have a tendency to drive them mad or kill them dead. Unexpectedly deadly weapons, barely contained plagues, tomes of forbidden knowledge, and garden variety radioactives all fall into this category. Depending on how unhealthy they are to be around, they might create cursed locations around them, deadly environments warped by the sheer malignance infused into the object itself. Or for, you know, set design. Technically speaking, this category includes almost all mythological cursed artifacts, which didn't tend to be particularly malevolent, but would do things like cause death and misfortune to anyone around them through the power of bad vibes. These cursed artifacts are more karmically unpleasant and cause bad luck or tragedy to follow them around. The most famous of these is probably Anvari's Ring, also known as the Ring of the Nibelung, which was stolen from the dwarf Anvari by Loki, causing Anvari to curse it to bring misfortune and death to its owner. Loki handed it off, and it proceeded to do just that, producing the plot of the Ring Cycle and, by extension, the one opera everyone knows about. The Ring doesn't really do anything, but bad things happen to the people around it. It basically just serves to justify the tragedy happening. Now, it's pretty clear by now that cursed artifacts come in all shapes and sizes, and it makes sense that they can correspondingly play a lot of different narrative roles. At its core, a cursed artifact is nothing more than a source of narrative conflict, and conflict can fit into a story in a lot of different ways. For instance, in some stories, the cursed artifact is in the MacGuffin slot. Everybody wants it, everybody's after it, the curse might even be that everybody wants it and will go to increasingly immoral lengths to get it. In some stories, the fact that the thing is cursed isn't obvious or known, and it is only revealed when they actually find it, producing some complications for the third act. While these cursed artifacts technically still aren't MacGuffins due to their unique properties, in some stories those properties don't actually factor into the story too much, making it kind of functionally a MacGuffin, a, a pseudo-MacGuffin, if you will. Now in other stories, the cursed artifact is in the inciting incident slot. These stories tend to rely a little more strongly on the actual unique properties of the artifact. Most commonly, the cursed artifact gives a character access to some sort of ability they didn't have before, and the story will dedicate some or all of the plot to exploring the consequences of that. Many of these stories will focus on the protagonist's downward spiral as the cursed artifact corrupts them with power and or evil magic. In some cases, they might even highlight that the artifact doesn't directly affect the character's morality at all, they just let the power get to their head and make them a worse person the regular way. But in some other cases, instead of getting a starting power-up from the artifact, the characters will have to go on some sort of adventure to destroy, contain, or otherwise uncurse the artifact and render it harmless. While some of these stories focus predominantly on the burden of the artifact on the protagonists, in others, the main characters might be on the quest because they're uniquely qualified to not be affected by the artifact's curse, and for whatever reason, are basically totally cool with it. An extremely pure-of-heart protagonist is common in these stories, and they tend not to focus too hard on the burden of the cursed artifact. This is common in more action-adventure-heavy stories. And in contrast, possibly most obviously, in some stories, the cursed artifact is in the antagonist slot. Whether the villain of the story is using a cursed artifact, or whether it's arguably the other way around, these stories complicate matters for the heroes by giving the bad guy access to the power of the cursed artifact without the downsides of the cursed part of it. Villains don't tend to worry about being morally corrupted by the stuff they use for evil, so this is a pretty clean way to give the bad guys access to a power-up that the good guys can't use. In fact, some stories will double down and let the villain use the artifact for ludicrously powerful effects because they're on the same page as the cursed artifact rather than resisting it. This is pretty much exclusive to sentient and malevolent cursed artifacts, which are basically just villains in their own right. In some stories, they might be being wielded by another villain, but in other stories, it might turn out that the artifact was actually the one calling the shots the whole time, and the person who's been swinging it around is just another victim who became fully controlled by it. This doesn't tend to happen with non-sentient cursed artifacts, but you do sometimes get stories where the villain's villainy is in large part motivated by an obsession with a non-sentient cursed artifact that may or may not be passively corrupting them over time. This is actually pretty common with mad scientist types who see something leaking cursed knowledge and just can't resist poking it with a stick. Now, there's a lot of flexibility in this trope, but the nature of the cursed artifact does to an extent determine some key details about the story around it. A cursed sword is probably going to see more combat than a cursed ring, and a cursed artifact whispering dark secrets to the holder is probably going to factor into a plotline about that character either resisting corruption or falling to it, while a passive cursed artifact might be more at home in a plotline about the human corruption of greed. Big dramatic cursed artifacts might be central to a hero's journey type adventure with an epic quest and a grand finale, but smaller, simpler cursed artifacts might be central to small-scale human tragedies where things fall apart due to human nature rather than massive armies of darkness. The most generic kind of cursed artifact is a thing that causes misfortune. This is a pretty basic concept and is very popular
popular in mythology and folklore. It's a fairly all-purpose curse, since basically all it does is cause narrative conflict. In some cases, it might not even be explicit that the artifact is at fault in any meaningful way. The bad stuff that happens around it might look like it has more to do with people being greedy jerks than with the artifact in question, which is pretty common in stories where the cursed artifact is just a seemingly mundane treasure, like a stash of gold or a valuable gem that has a reputation for being cursed because people keep murdering each other about it. These artifacts are basically just generic conflict drivers, and in some cases might even be functionally interchangeable pseudo-MacGuffins with no overt cursed properties. But in most stories, the artifact has at least one other property that makes things a little more interesting. For instance, the monkey's paw is a cursed artifact that causes misfortune by granting wishes in the most needlessly unpleasant way possible. It causes misfortune, sure, but the real focus is on the be careful what you wish for message and how getting what you think you want isn't always a good thing. Of course, for a lot of people, the actual takeaway from that story is that you could totally outsmart the asshole wish grantor and get everything you want just by being really specific with your wishes. And this is actually a surprisingly common audience response to cursed artifact stories. People love speculating about how they'd handle a cursed artifact. Outsmart it, use it for good, lean into the evil, handle it through sheer heroic gumption. And I honestly can't decide if this is a flaw or a feature. It feels like a flaw in the writing, because if the point of the story is to highlight that the cursed thingy is bad and never goes well, it seems like, if the story does its job right, the audience probably shouldn't conclude that the cursed thingy could go well if they were the one who got it. But on the flip side, I feel like that's actually a testament to the allure of the cursed thingy in question, that even an audience with an omniscient perspective on the damage it does can feel tempted to give it their best shot. Is it better to write a cursed artifact so alluring that the audience feels drawn to imagine how it'd work in their hands, or is it better to write a downfall so devastatingly thorough that the audience feels fear and disgust at the cursed thing that caused it? And honestly, I think it depends on the artifact. I don't see anywhere near as many Reddit threads about how people could totally handle the Ring of the Nibelung versus, like, the Death Note. Some cursed artifacts are tempting from both a character and an audience perspective. A cursed murder sword or an evil ring might or might not draw a modern audience's eye, but a wish-granting artifact or an instant kill anyone button tugs at the imagination. And if the writer gets the audience thinking, hey, maybe it would be cool to have this thing, imagine the problems it could solve, the writer now has an angle of audience investment they can use to explore that question and theoretically demonstrate why it wouldn't actually give them what they wanted, or that at minimum it wouldn't be worth the personal cost. Of course, the effectiveness of this depends on the execution. And again, I can't decide if this is a bug or a feature. If a story about a malignant cursed artifact that explicitly destroys everyone it touches ends with the audience still feeling like they could totally handle it and get it right, that does miss the point of the story. But it also highlights the other point of the story, that the cursed artifact is a temptation that most people can't resist, even from behind the fourth wall. The monkey's paw story is a fun little vignette about an asshole wish grander that interprets every wish in the most actively harmful way possible, but we really only see it used three times. First, the users wish for a little bit of money, which they get as compensation for the horrible death of their son. Then one of them wishes for the son to come back, but it's heavily implied that he doesn't get unmangled in the process, so the third wish puts him back in the grave permanently. This highlights that the monkey's paw is a dick, but it also teases the imagination because it doesn't cover a lot of bases. Maybe if you wished for a lot of money from a highly specific source, you'd be fine, right? Or wished someone back from the dead but completely healed from what killed them. Maybe if you got a lawyer to go over your wishes for you first, you could make sure they were loophole-free. The appeal of a wish-granting artifact is obvious, but this kind of thing even happens with stories where the cursed artifact doesn't actually seem all that useful or appealing to an outside audience. People love coming up with other simpler ways the Fellowship could have destroyed the One Ring. Personally, I'm partial to the Legolas ties it to an arrow and fires it into Mount Doom solution, but that's not really the point. Even in a story where the cursed artifact doesn't really tempt the audience's imagination on its own, there's still a temptation to outsmart the story and the characters in it. Things could have been fine if the characters just did this one thing or made this one choice. And this phenomenon is not limited to cursed artifact stories, but it does crop up in them a lot, because frequently, cursed artifacts lead characters to make questionable decisions. The corruptive ones actively push characters towards evil, while the misfortune ones just make bad stuff happen around them, often because the characters make questionable decisions. And any time a character makes a choice the audience knows is bad, it's natural for the audience to think about how things would have turned out if they'd made a different choice instead. And this ties back into something I touched on in the trope talk on tragedies. A huge factor in tragedies is that the nature of the characters makes the tragedy inevitable. The decisions the character would make because of who they are as people brings them into conflict and leads to disaster. In many cursed artifact stories, the artifact is just a catalyst for that kind of conflict. It might push the character to make a bad decision, but not an out-of-character decision. A cursed artifact in this kind of story is just a crystallized bad situation that puts the characters into a context where their traits become flaws. The cheerful, humble couple that gets the monkey's paw make a simple wish for a small sum of money and their life crumbles around their ears. The people powerful and heroic enough to quickly and efficiently destroy the One Ring are the same people most susceptible to its temptations to use it for the good of the world. The person wielding the actively malevolent Demon Blade Stormbringer is so frail and sick that he's only capable of doing good, or doing anything, because of the power that evil sword provides, so he concludes his only 
option is to use the sword or be useless himself. The idea that someone else might have had better luck with the cursed artifact is a reasonable conclusion in many cases because so many cursed artifacts play to the specific nature of the character dealing with them. And sometimes that's even explored in story. Hell, even in Lord of the Rings, where they go out of their way to explain that the ring can get into anyone's head and tempt them with their greatest desire or whatever, when it tries to get Sam on its side, it literally can't figure out what he wants because the ring is very grandiose in its temptations and Sam's not interested in a garden the size of a city. He just wants one small enough for him to tend. The ring might have been able to wear him down eventually, but it was not going to be easy. And there are plenty of stories that actively play into this. Sometimes a cursed artifact starts out with a hero and has a terrible time trying to corrupt them because of their dang heroic gumption, only to later jump ship and end up with a villain who has exactly no problem embracing the dark side and is significantly easier to corrupt and control. Sometimes the cursed artifact actively selects for people who are vulnerable to it and never deals with anyone who could use it responsibly. But sometimes the story takes a slightly different angle. The cursed artifact will corrupt anyone who uses it, but the real measure of narrative heroism is who wouldn't be willing to use it. Maybe the monkey's paw can be outsmarted, but the gist of the story seems to be that anybody who uses it will suffer, no matter how clever they try to be. So the only way to win is not to play. The reason Sam doesn't get corrupted or tempted by the ring is because it has nothing he wants, and thus he has no desire to use it. In these stories, instead of any one bad decision messing up their chance to use the artifact responsibly, the character dooms themselves by choosing to use the artifact at all. This can be difficult to convince an audience of, since the story can only present examples of characters who were beaten by the artifact and the audience's temptation to outsmart them can be bolstered by knowing where those characters went wrong. But honestly, feature or flaw, I don't think this is a bad thing. It's just a very specific way for the audience to critically engage with the story, and that's always fun. It's not the writer's job to convince the audience of anything, even the moral of their own story. They just gotta tell it. So. Yeah, and thanks again to Campfire for sponsoring this video. You may have heard by now that Campfire is a browser-based tool suite designed to help writers write and world build. Campfire Write lets you organize your story with modules like character sheets, relationship webs, timelines, and a manuscript editor that lets you check your notes the whole time you're writing. Campfire Write's modules are, appropriately, modular, so you can choose exactly which tools you want and only pay for what you need. Campfire Write also comes in an offline desktop app now, so you can keep working even without an internet connection. Plus, they've rolled out Campfire Learn, a resource hub for writers, and Campfire Explore, a community where you can share your work and start building your audience before the story's even out. If all that sounds interesting, you can make an account for free and try it out. And if you want more, you can build your own tool suite for as low as 25 cents a month. You can also unlock everything for a few dollars a month with a 30-day return policy if you change your mind. Campfire is constantly updating with more good things on the way, so stay tuned for more tools. If you're curious, check out the link in the description, and remember to use the promo code OSP for 20% off a lifetime purchase of Campfire.